So today I'd like to talk about a couple of sort of classroom or uh, textbook examples of, of the theory for <clears throat> small deformation theory for elastic plastic response. And just to summarize where we are at the moment for isotropic materials, um, we had this infinitesimal strain. If derivative, time derivative, material derivative is can be decomposed in this way approximately, time derivative of an, of an elastic part and then a plastic part. Epsilon is the total infinitesimal strain, uh, symmetric part of the gradient of the displacement. The elastic part is the moduli operating on the rate of Cauchy stress, if you recall. So we know what this operation looks like for isotropic materials, let's say. And then we have the von Mises flow rule for the small deformation theory. So let's um, run through a couple of it. simple examples. Um, just to these are these are chosen to be simple enough so that <clears throat> they're easy to do and mainly to illustrate how the theory works. Okay. So one of the simplest problems we can think of, and these you can find in the books we've uh, alluded to already, Hill, Kachanov, Lubliner, and so on. <clears throat> Let's look at the torsion of a prismatic bar. Let's say a circular cross-section, the simplest case. And this is really a strength of materials problem, right? undergraduate problem. <clears throat> Let's set it up in our formalism. So we have a, a cylinder with axis uh, coming out of the screen say the, the E3 axis or the Z axis. And here's a cross section, a plane corresponding to a constant value of Z. And we can set up a polar coordinate system, say for, to, to uh, conform to the uh, cylindrical geometry here, cylindrical polar coordinate system, radius and azimuth, I'll call it theta. We called it phi before. <clears throat> So a material point initially at some radius and some azimuth theta, say right here where my cursor is, when you twist the bar, <clears throat> you can imagine that material point will simply rotate to a new position, perhaps without changing its radius, just change its azimuth. As we twist the bar, each, each section is equal constant, rotates by a different amount depending on z. Let's suppose that rotation angle is a linear function of z. So z equals zero is one end of the bar and z equals say l is the other end of a bar of length l. And in between, for points z in between, cross sections z equal constant in between, there's a linear variation of the rotation of the cross section with z. So we'll assign a, a, a twist, which is a, a rotation per unit length, unit length along the axis, call that psi, and suppose it increases with time. <coughs> so position in a reference, say, say we take this to be the reference configuration and it's under our assumed deformation here. The only difference between the reference configuration and the current one is the rotation of the cross section. Uh, let's see if we can construct a solution uh, under this premise. Okay, so position in the reference is radius along ER at azimuth theta plus Z along K. K is the axis E3 of the, of the cylinder. <clears throat> and let's construct the displacement then and the displacement gradient. So the displacement, the form position minus the shifted reference position, right? If you recall, this being necessary to make this vector subtraction operation meaningful. You need the shifter to place both elements to be subtracted into the same vector space so that we can carry out the subtraction. So prior to deformation, we have this, we shift, we'll shift this. We'll call say ER star is the shifted version of ER. It's the same vector, but now regarded as an element of the appropriate vector space. 
K star, likewise, is the shifted version of K. And if we subtract the final position here, would be, which would be radius, say R, along ER star, the shifted version of ER, evaluated at theta plus psi Z, subtract this position, R along ER star, the shifted version of ER, evaluated at azimuth theta, and then if there's no axial displacement, we'll, which we'll assume, then the difference of the axial positions cancels out and we just get this displacement. So this is still a finite displacement. <clears throat> Let's compute the two-point tensor, the, the, the displacement gradient, in the usual way by the, by the chain rule. And we just take the derivative then of everything that we see. Let's hold R fixed and take the differential of this. That would be the derivative of ER star with respect to its argument, which is E theta star at the same argument, then times the derivative of the argument, which is D theta plus psi DZ, psi taken to be uniform. Then the D of this would be E theta star at azimuth theta times D theta. And then we need to take the differential of R. Okay, so we have these extra terms. We need then to factor out a D capital X using this expression here for capital X. We can deduce that, for example, D theta here, which appears in a couple of terms, is one over R E theta without the star evaluated at theta dot D capital X. DZ is K without the star dot D capital X. DR is ER without the star dot D capital X. Remember the starred and unstarred vectors, think of them as the same vector, but they occupy distinct vector spaces. So then just by inserting these results in here and comparing the two sides of the equation, which purports to be valid for arbitrary D capital X, you immediately deduce then that the <clears throat> displacement gradient is ER star at theta plus psi Z, tensor product ER at theta and so on, E theta star at theta plus psi Z, tensor product E theta at theta and so on, R psi, right? So you get here an R psi, E theta star, DZ involves a K, so you have tensor product K and then this one ER star at theta, tensor product ER from this term, okay? <clears throat> so far, no approximations have been made. This is a, it's been treated as a, as a general finite deformation. Let's now suppose that the, the rotation of a, cross, of a given cross section is, is very small. That is the twist, the rotation pre unit axial length times the axial length is always much less than one throughout the bar, say from zero to its total length. <coughs> and let's, let's likewise assume that psi times r, which is again a dimensionless number, is much less than one for r in, in the cross section. And here we can allow a, say a hollow cross section. Right, we can, we can consider the cross section to be this annular region contained between the concentric circles radius A and B. And so we're making an assumption about the kinematics of the deformation. This is uh, following an old idea of Saint Benoit, you know, a century and a half ago, uh, and has since come to be called the semi-inverse method in which we assume something about the deformation a priori and then let the equations decide whether or not the assumption is viable. That is to say whether or not it leads to an actual solution to the problem. So <clears throat> let's see. I'm sure most of you have seen this kind of procedure already. So let's estimate, for example, 
the vectors evaluated at theta plus psi z, let's estimate those for small values of psi z. Just do a Taylor expansion here. We get er star at theta plus the difference between theta plus psi z and theta, namely psi z times the derivative of this evaluated at psi z equals zero, which would be e, e theta star at theta and so on, plus quadratic terms in the product psi z, which we intend to neglect. E theta star likewise, this will involve a derivative of E theta star evaluated at psi z equals zero. That derivative is minus E r star, okay? So we have a sign change here. Insert these results here. Here we're gonna have an r times psi times a psi z. These are both tiny, so we'll neglect that product. And ultimately we get this expression, approximate expression for the displacement gradient. We want the spatial displacement displacement gradient that's related to capital grad U in, the, in this way exactly. Spatial gradient view times F, F is approximated by the shifter, you recall. So we have spatial gradient U times the shifter is approximately this. To get this, we multiply on the right by the transpose of the shifter. <coughs> For example, you'd have a this tensor product with a with a shifter on the right, but that's the same as inserting the transpose of the shifter right here. Um, let's see if, if that's right. No, sorry, I'd have a, a shifter transpose on the right of k for this, picking this this term as an example. This multiplied by transpose of shifter with this tensor product of two vectors, that's the same as inserting the transpose of the transpose right here in front of the K, namely inserting the one in front of the K and one of the, in front of the K is K star. So for example, you get a K star from this term. And likewise, you, the remaining ones just convert these ER and E theta to ER star and ER E theta star. Okay, so everything's consistent. We have a spatial gradient of U is in fact a spatial tensor because it's expressed here in terms of the shifted basis elements. Okay, um, to avoid excessive writing, henceforth I'm going to drop the star notation. So you just should understand these vectors to be the shifted vectors. We want the symmetric part of this. Notice that this part is skew. This gives a effectively a rigid rotation of the section located at that constant value of z. So that, that disappears when we calculate the infinitesimal strain and we just get the symmetric part of this, which is this with the stars not suppressed. <clears throat> and the trace of that is obviously zero. So we have an isochoric deformation. Let's look at the elastic solution, which means <clears throat> we have no plastic strain this, the strain then is the, all elastic. The Cauchy stress, as usual, <clears throat> trace of epsilon is zero. So this will just be purely deviatoric because the strain tensor is itself deviatoric. And if you insert this, you simply get the classical linear variation of stress with radius. And the, these are shear stresses on the Z theta axes. <clears throat> And this is of course deviatoric, so the stress is equal to its deviatoric part. <coughs> okay, so let's see if we've been wasting our time or if we have a viable solution. Um, let's look at the divergence of the stress. In, in some homework problem, I've asked you to calculate an expression for the divergence of the stress in polars. Here's what you get if the, all the stress components are independent of Z, which is certainly the case here. Not only are they independent of Z, but they're also independent of theta. So let's see, there's no RR component, right? If you look at this, there's no theta theta component and there's not even an R theta component. So this is identically zero. This is identically zero. There's no theta theta component. 
here we have RZ, that would be the coefficient of ER tensor product K, which is zero. We do have a theta Z component, namely mu psi R, but it's independent of theta. Actually, that's not true. Well, well, I guess it is, yeah. So one over R times T theta Z would give you mu psi, which is a constant, no theta derivative. So the stress field we've computed has zero divergence, which means the problem we're solving is one of equilibrium without body force, as usual. <clears throat> so far, so good. Um, let's figure out what boundary conditions we, we can satisfy. Let's look at the traction. The traction is delivered by the stress field, say on the lateral surfaces. On the exterior cylindrical surface, the normal is ER. On the interior cylindrical surface, it's minus ER. For either one of those, right? Operate T on ER, you get zero in both cases. So we have no traction either on the interior or the exterior lateral surface. So we've solved the problem of <clears throat> twisting a, a cylindrical shaft or bar with no tractions on the generating surfaces and no body force. <clears throat> Concerning the cross, we can look at the tractions on a cross section where N is K coming out of the screen. The traction there is T on K. And if you look at T, operate on K, you get this linear variation with radius, classical result, mu times the the rate of twist times radius times e theta purely azimuthal, but varying linearly with radius. <clears throat> with that, we can compute the resultant force on a cross section, like so. Um, break this up into, let's see, dA, the, the area measure, is r dr d theta in polar coordinates. So we have an r already, we get r squared dr. Then we have an e theta that depends only on theta, but its integral over two, from zero to two pi is actually zero. You can easily see that because e theta is the derivative of er. So this integral gives you er between the endpoints, but they're the same endpoints in the integral. So this vanishes. There's no resultant force on the cross section, even though there is a traction distribution on the cross section. <clears throat> Of course, the, 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 the variable of main interest in this example is the torque required to produce the twist. <coughs> Let's compute the torque uh, generated by the tractions acting on a cross section relative to any point we like, say x zero. Then that torque would be the integral of x minus x zero cross t over the cross sectional area. x cross t then minus x naught, a fixed point, cross the integral of t dA, which is the force, which is zero. So it doesn't matter how we choose x zero, we're gonna get the same torque because the resultant force, of course, is zero. For x, let's write R E R plus Z K, bearing in mind that we're looking at the torque generated by the tractions on a cross section where Z is constant, okay, and then cross the traction. That gives R E R cross T. Z is constant in this integral. So it comes out, we just get K cross the resultant force, which is zero. So we just get E R cross T. E R cross T involves E R cross E theta, which is a K. Fixed factor comes outside. And we get mu psi times the integral of R over the cross sectional area which will be two pi integral from inside to outside of them. Uh, we have an R already. We have an R here. We have an R here that's R squared and then another R from the area measure. And that gives us some, we'll call it capital I. You can trivially write that down what it is explicitly in terms of A and B. That's the polar moment of the cross-sectional area. So that's the classical elastic solution, a purely axial torque, twisting torque <clears throat> along the axis of the cylinder of amount that's 
proportional to the twist rate, twist per unit length. And that's given, so this is the rigidity of the cross section, the shear modulus times the polar moment of the section. <coughs> okay, so all that is strength of materials, very trivial. We're interested in exploring uh, the possibility of yield. Let's say psi is some increasing function of time, the twist per unit length. We, we generate, we, we, we twist the cylinder, the, the bar monotonically in time like this. So that as time increases, that's, the, that's equivalent to saying that psi increases. So as the rate of twist increases, you, let's say this is prescribed function of time, yield first occurs at a, a time t sub y, t sub yield, when according to the von Mises criterion, this is satisfied, a half the squared norm of the deviatoric stress is the square of the yield stress in shear. And we know the deviatoric stress We compute the square of its norm, the inner product of tau with itself. You can do that easily. You get twice quantity mu psi r all squared. <clears throat> and then we have yield. Everything here is positive. Mu psi and r are positive by assumption. Psi is positive by assumption. Then we have yield when mu psi r is equal to k. And that for a given psi that will first occur when r is equal to b, right? This is max, you, you first encounter the value k, say, when when r is equal to b, that's the first, the first set of material points to yield are those at the outside extremity of the cross-section. So yield will occur at a time ty when your prescribed function psi reaches this value. <clears throat> Sorry, this K over mu, I wrote capital R here, it should be B for consistency. I think I was copying my notes incorrectly. And I've done it again here. The corresponding twisting moment is this. Capital R here should again be B. So please make that correction in your notes where you see a capital R, make it B. <clears throat> so you expect then for later times after the time required to initiate yield, yield starts here. And as you continue to twist the bar, there'll be a zone of yielded material adjacent to the, adjacent to the outside radius, say in some annular region between radius C and radius B. And we, we can figure out what the radius C must be for time uh, post after the initiation of yield. So you continue to twist, you give psi as a function of time. That's K over mu instead of B now, or, which I miswrote as capital R. The operative radius is now C, right? Because you have yield in, you have yield commencing at a radius C, okay? And that, that radius then is this function of time. If you prescribe the, the twist rate, the twist uh, pre, uh, as a function of time, you can compute C. So C decreases with, t with time as you increase Psi, as you'd expect. So the yielded zone consumes more and more of the cross section. <clears throat> Inside that annular region between C and B, the material has yielded, right? And the stress there is this. If you look back, so you have uh, mu tau times R is the stress that's reached the yield value, K. <clears throat> So the deviatoric stress saturates to this value here. 
And let's assume that it stays at that value. So the intensity stays at the value K. Let's assume and check after the fact that we have a solution. Assume that tau does not further evolve with time in the yielded zone between for R between C and B. And let's assume that the there is no pressure in the problem. Then we have, let's see, what do we have? Well, this is certainly a, an equilibrium field without pressure. Right? T equal tau, this, this tau gives you an equilibrium stress field, no doubt. You can verify that easily, provided the pressure is zero. So <clears throat> with the Cauchy stress equal to this deviatoric stress, which is fixed then, the rate of change of strain would be the, the compliance operating on the rate of change of T, which would be zero under our assumption, plus the plastic part, which is lambda times tau from the von Mises condition. So that's just lambda tau in the region between C and B, the plastic region. <clears throat> On the other hand, epsilon dot, we know from the, from the assumed kinematics that we had in the beginning is a half psi dot r times this combination of basis elements. So just by comparing these two sides, we get a half psi dot r is lambda k, which you can use to figure out lambda. And indeed, then, with psi increasing in time and the radius positive, lambda is positive as required by this dissipation inequality that was funda a fundamental aspect of the theory. So we conclude, conclude here that all conditions of the problem are satisfied, and we indeed have a solution. Um, let's look at what happens with the torque uh, generated by the traction on a cross section as the material continues to yield, the cross-section continues to yield. <coughs> so here's the, um, as we had before, RER cross tau K, there's no result in force on the section. Tau on K is mu psi R E theta for R in the elastic region. Let's take a solid section with A, the inner radius equal to zero, just for, to keep things simple. So for R between zero and C, which is the boundary of the, between the elastic and plastic zones, we have the elastic solution with namely attraction increasing linearly with radius. Then for R between, this should be C and B. Again, my apologies. Instead of a zero right here, you should write a C. This is the plastic zone now. We have tau K just field stress and shear times e theta, so a constant intensity. And then we simply need to calculate this torque. So uh, when we integrate, uh, I also need the two pi's here. I've been very sloppy. So in this line, reinsert the two pi's from the dA. We get the integral of the, in the, the elastic solution and then the plastic part. And here the, the pi's appear again. So another transcription error you can easily correct. So here's the torque on a cross section as a function of the radius C between the elastic, the boundary between the elastic and plastic regions. Remember that's related to the twist angle in this manner, yield stress and shear divided by mu C. So we can rewrite the total torque in this way, either as a function of C or as a function of Psi. <clears throat> so you can see then that as time evolves, assuming Psi dot is positive, you'll have also M dot is positive. <clears throat> so, M always has a positive derivative with respect to time as for, for psi an increasing function of time. And if, if you let psi get large, the, the, the twist rate uh, 
grow without bound, of course, doing so puts you outside the range of the linear kinematics that we've assumed. But this would give you some kind of a, a, a feeling for the asymptotic limit, uh, namely the, the maximum moment that the shaft can sustain. <coughs> this approaches, for psi getting large, it approaches this value, which is four-thirds of the, the value of the moment required to initiate yield at the outside radius. So the global response of the bar looks like this. You reach an ultimate moment that you never quite reach. You, you approach it asymptotically. And it's <clears throat> substantially above the twisting moment required to initiate yield. And so you see <clears throat> you have this nonlinear global response which looks like a kind of a strain hardening effect, even though the material itself is not strain hardened according to our assumption, perfect plasticity, elastic, perfectly plastic material. So because of the, because of the, the residual elastic region, you have, still have the stiffness, although it becomes less and less significant with increasing twist. <clears throat> Okay, so there's, there's a fairly well-developed theory also for bars of non-circular cross-section. So a shaft of say square, rectangular, any, any shape cross-section, while the, the shaft remains prismatic. In other words, you generate the entire bar by taking the cross-section and, and, and uh, transporting it parallel to the axis. That's called a prismatic bar. There's a well-developed theory for, the, for those as well. I'll refer you to Hill and Kachanov and Lubliner for that. <clears throat> the, only, the interesting feature of the non-circular section is that there's a warping displacement. In addition to this rotation of the cross-section, there's also a warping effect so that the cross-section does not re remain plain. It warps. And that in elasticity, that's a classical subtopic of elasticity due to St. Bernard, the same St. Bernard we've been talking about. And um, <clears throat> it's been extended to accommodate plasticity. You can find that discussion in these books. And rather than repeat that discussion here, I think it's more efficient if you simply have a look at those sources if you're interested in that. <coughs> And there are a number of explicit solutions worked out as well in that context. Okay, another sort of textbook example is the problem of spherical symmetry. So suppose you have a, a spherical annulus, I've drawn here uh, fairly poorly, concentric spheres, the material is in between the sphere of radius A and the sphere of radius B. The material occupies this spherical annulus in between. And we'll suppose that there's an internal pressure applied and we're interested in the response, the elastic plastic response of the material to increasing internal pressure. This problem is also well described, particularly in Hill, Hill, Hill's book and Lubliner's book. I encourage you to read those. By the way, uh, on Thursday, we'll describe a kind of much more interesting example that you won't find in textbooks um, pertaining to fracture, actually. So, but for the moment, let's let's talk about this uh, this problem. Again, it it serves to illustrate in a fairly simple way how the theory works. Um, let's introduce a spherical coordinate system. So you have a, a radius vector to a point in space. And if you project that down to the x1, x2 plane, that describes a ray in the x1, x2 plane. <clears throat> that ray makes azim uh, the angle azimuthal angle theta with the x1 axis. And then we can use an elevation angle, call it phi. So this would be, uh, phi would be uh, latitude, on the earth, let's say, theta is longitude, okay? And that phi then gives us the angle 
that this radius vector makes with the x1, x2 plane. <clears throat> okay, so if we have a need for coordinates, we will use these spherical coordinates here. Um, let's introduce a plausible assumption. The material is isotropic and uniform. The, the loading, the pressure is spherically symmetric as well. So this, you have spherical symmetry in this problem. We expect a spherically symmetric displacement field to furnish a solution. It may not be the only solution. We don't have the uniqueness result proved, but it's plausible to assume then that you have at least a solution which exhibits this same physical uh, spherical symmetry. So we'll suppose the displacement is a purely radial displacement, the scalar field U directed along the radius vector. U positive means the displacement is outward along the radius. U negative means the displacement is inward along the same radial direction. So we'll introduce a unit vector ER, which now depends on theta and phi, and which is simply the normalized position vector. Take the position, divide by its magnitude. There should be a norm X position X in here in this spot. That's the radius, that's just the norm of the position vector. So some time ago when we were looking at examples, we were doing a analysis in curvilinear coordinates, we did an example using spherical coordinates. And the notation here is the same as in that example. <clears throat> okay, so we'll assume that the scalar field depends on radius only and, and time t pressure will take to be a function of time, <clears throat> the inflation pressure at the inside radius. Okay, um, so this would mean, for example, a sphere of a given radius, R, is displaced to a concentric sphere by this displacement field. Okay, <coughs> so with ER given this way, we can write the displacement as U over R times position X, and I want to compute, say, the displacement gradient. For that, I'll need dr. The way you get that is to write from this equation, put, put the r on the other side, you get r e r is equal to x. Dot that equation with itself, you get r squared is x dot x. Take the derivative of that, you get dr is 1 over r x dot dx. And that's all you need to compute the displacement gradient. So for example, du. is um, du dr times dr. dr is one over r. So du d, so you have one over r du dr, which is u prime, times dr brings down another r. So you have one over r squared u prime, then x, x here, and then x dot dx, okay? Then you have to take a derivative of one over r, gives you minus one over r squared. We already have the one over r from here, x and then x dot dx again. And then you hold this parenthesis fixed and take dx, which you can write as identity dot uh, identity on dx because we intend to factor out a tensor from this expression. So immediately displacement gradient is one over r squared u prime minus u over r cubed, x tensor product x plus u over r times identity that's symmetric by inspection, and therefore that's the same as the infinitesimal strain. Okay, so we can we can put this on the, an orthonormal basis. So, uh, re write x as r e r, for example. You get this, and we have u over r identity minus e r tensor product e r from this term. This is just e theta e theta plus e phi e phi, the same vectors back in that much earlier example. E theta is the azimuthal unit vector that points due, uh, due east on, on the surface of the earth. E phi is the unit vector that points due north on the surface of the earth. 
So this basis representation is useful for purposes of interpretation. It tells you that the R, R component of E is U prime, the, the UDR. It can be a time dependence here as well, but the prime means an R derivative. The theta theta and phi phi components are both the same. These are the so-called hoop, str hoop strains, U over R. All other strain components are zero on this basis. Notice, by the way, that we can immediately write down a compatibility condition that doesn't involve the displacements. ERR is U prime, which is the, the same as the prime of R times E theta theta, right? I don't know if we'll need that compatibility condition or not. <clears throat> okay, well, suppose given the structure of the strain tensor, we'll suppose that the, the stress tensor has the same non-zero components and moreover that the phi phi and theta theta components of the stress are the same as they are for the, the strains. <clears throat> and we'll suppose those are the non-zero stresses and then we'll verify if this assumption leads to a viable solution. Now, I have, I've not given you the equation of equilibrium in spherical coordinates. <clears throat> These components, by the way, are the same, are the, are the components of T on the same basis, ER, ER, E theta, E theta, E phi, E phi, which are all unit vectors. They're not the Gs, the natural basis vectors or their or the dual vectors, but you can easily recast them in terms of those. And if you want, as a, an exercise, you could derive this for yourselves quite easily. I won't bother you about that. It's fairly routine. There's, there's under our assumptions, there's one non-trivial equation of equilibrium, supposing that these all depend only on radius and, and possibly time. And this is the one non-trivial equilibrium equation that survives under those assumptions. <clears throat> okay, um, let's derive the elastic solution first and then in investigate conditions under which yielding can initiate. Uh, the stress-strain relation, as usual, lame moduli. Take the trace. Uh, the trace of the strain, we already have the strain from above. Take the trace of that, you get U prime plus U, two U over R, right? Take the trace of this tensor, you get two U over R, then U, R, U prime. Then the R, R components of the stress, will, that will bring in this term with the trace. And then the R, R components of epsilon here is U prime. So we have the TRR in terms of the displacement. Likewise, you get T theta theta and T phi phi. They're the same under our assumptions, just from the kinematics in the elastic solution that we've assumed. They turn out they're the same. Okay. So, so far, so good. Our assumptions are viable so far. And this is the, these are then the hoop stresses. And the difference, TRR minus T theta theta, that plays a role here in the equilibrium equation, is just this. So if you put this together with TRR and do a, a little bit of algebra, you'll find that the equilibrium equation boils down to this, lambda plus two mu, the lambda moduli, times this combination of the derivatives, which is the same as the derivative of this combination. <clears throat> and lambda plus two mu is positive under our hypotheses. For example, lambda plus two mu is the same as the bulk modulus plus four thirds mu. Each one of these is positive for positive definite strain energy. So the whole combination is positive, which means we have to solve this the, the prime of this parenthesis equals zero, which means that parenthesis is, a, is at most a function of t independent of r. Well, let's write it as three a of t. It's convenient to put the three here because it'll disappear later. So 
to, to, to get the displacement, you recognize the fact that this is simply one over R squared times the prime of R squared U. Put your R squared on the other side and integrate and then divide by R squared and you get this. So B is another integration constant with respect to R, possible function of time. So this is the most general elastic displacement field consistent with our assumptions. So again, we're pursuing a kind of semi-inverse strategy, uh, mainly to make life a little less arduous. Uh, we exploit the spherical symmetry and look for a spherically symmetric solution. <clears throat> okay, um, the strains then we can compute immediately in terms of these as yet to be determined functions A and B of T. The hoop strains likewise. Take the trace, we find that that's just three A of T. And the interesting thing about that is that the trace, which gives you the dilation in the material, volume, local volume change, is uniformly distributed <clears throat> throughout the material. Okay, so we can go back and compute the stresses now from the displacement. We have the, we have the strains in terms of radius and A and B, we can go back and compute the stresses. We get these. And now let's put in the boundary conditions. At the inside radius, the traction, which the, the only, the, the, the traction will have only one component, which is TRR, and that has to be balanced by the negative of the pressure, right? We can verify that quickly. So we evaluate the TRR at R equal A, at the outside radius, suppose we're applying no traction, in particular, <clears throat> TRR then at R equal B, it has to be zero. So we get two equations for A and B. And here they are in terms of the pressure and the moduli. We consider here P. P is the pressure exerted at the inside boundary. We'll suppose that to be an assigned function of time. Okay, with these, with A and B known now, we can go back here and compute the stress as a, as a function of radius and the pressure and the dimensions of the sphere. And we get these stress, non-zero stress components here. And what's interesting to note is that the stresses are independent of the elastic moduli, which is kind of remarkable. <coughs> Even though we used the stress strain relation to compute them, ultimately they proved to be independent of the moduli. And that's because essentially because we had we have pure traction conditions assigned here. Also, um, let's make note of the fact before we proceed that T theta theta minus RR is positive everywhere. Okay. Okay, so let's have a look at yielding. Our yield criterion involves the deviatoric stress. So that's the first order of business is to work out the deviatoric stress. Tau defined as usual. This will have non-zero components, tau RR, tau theta theta, and tau phi phi, which we can read off. So the trace of T, of T, uh, the trace of T here is TRR plus T theta theta plus T phi phi, but T phi phi is equal to T theta theta, so we get this for the trace. Subtract one third of that from TRR and you get tau RR in terms of the Cauchy stresses. Likewise, tau theta theta, you can easily compute. And that's the same as tau phi phi. So the deviatoric stress has this structure. Non-zero components RR and theta theta and phi phi components. We need the squared norm of that. So square this and take the trace to get the squared norm of tau. You'll get this tau RR squared plus two tau. That should be a tau theta theta squared. Here you have tau RR and tau theta theta. Add them in this combination, you just get this. So for yielding, then, 
according to the von Mises criterion, yield occurs when a half squared norm of tau equals k squared. In other words, when this is true. So yield occurs when tau theta theta minus tau r, r reaches the square root of three times the yield stress and shear. And tau theta theta minus tau r, r according to our elastic solution is given here in terms of the pressure and radius. Okay. So the largest that this value can have at a given pressure occurs when the radius is the smallest, right? namely at r equals a, the in interior radius. So the pressure at which yield initiates then can be computed by putting this into the left-hand side here and putting r equal a. And that gives you the, the pressure at which I should insert here yield initiates. I've been, I've been lazy in transcribing these notes. But yield initiates at this pressure P sub Y for yield. And that for, happens, that's the pressure at which the material is just on the verge of yielding at the inside radius. The rest of the material remains elastic at this pressure. You can imagine then as pressure is increased above this value, there'll be a, a plastic zone developing adjacent to the inside radius, extending from the inside radius to a radius C, let's say, that we don't know yet. With C, of course, the maximum it could possibly be is the outside radius, but less than or equal to B, of course. So the plastic zone we would expect to develop in a spherical annular region adjoining the inside boundary, while the exterior region from say C to the exterior radius remains, in, it remains elastic, hasn't yielded yet. Okay, so in the elastic region for R between C and B, we're, we're, we're gonna figure out what C is eventually the stresses can be read off from our elastic solution. The pressure in the elastic solution was the pressure at the inside radius in the elastic region, which was A, but now that inside radius is C. So it's, we'll write the pressure as P sub C. In place of A, we put C. Everything else is the same. So you can check, of course, this, when R is equal to C, this is minus P sub C. That, so that's the pressure existing at radius equals C, the radial pressure. So that's the pressure exerted on the elastic zone at the interior, at the inside of the elastic zone. Likewise, the hoop stresses can be read off in the, again in the elastic region from our, our elastic solution, just replace A by C and replace P by P sub C. And P sub C, is, an, is the same as PY with A replaced by C. Right? This is the pressure required to initiate yield at R equal A. This is the pressure required to cause yield at R equals C. Okay, so we know everything in terms of C, which of course remains unknown at this point. Okay. Um, Let's look at what happens now. And so, so we, we, have the, we have the full solution in the elastic region that remains after the yield has progressed, all in terms of the unknown parameter C, which is the radius dividing the elastic and plastic regions. The plastic region between A and C, the material is yielded, so the yield criterion is satisfied. <clears throat> That's handy because this combination appears in the equation of equilibrium. And that combination is just a constant. Here's the equation of equilibrium we have to solve. Right? Assuming the spherical symmetry is still valid. So this is particularly simple. It's just the derivative of TRR then is just some constant divided by radius, integrate and you get TRR, 
apart from a constant or a function of time. And then T theta theta and T phi phi come from this equation. Once you know TRR, you just put it in the right-hand side here and you have immediately T theta theta. So let's see, we're in the plastic zone. The plastic zone encompasses the inner boundary. The traction at the inner boundary must be balanced by the prescribed pressure. So we impose our minus the pressure is TRR at the inside boundary. And that gives us this constant or more appropriately a function of time. TRR is minus P then plus this natural log R over A, which of course is equal to minus P at R equals A. T theta theta and T phi phi, as we've just indicated, once you have TRR, you go back to the yield function to find these stresses, back to the yield criterion, and immediately you get all the non-zero stresses. This then is true in the plastic zone from the inside boundary up to the radius C that divides the elastic and plastic regions. Let's see, we can get some information here by imposing the continuity of traction at that boundary between the elastic and plastic regions. Okay. So let's see, here's the contribution from the plastic part. TRR in the elastic region, evaluated at that interface, is minus P sub C, which we've already seen. We've already had an expression for P sub C. That's P at radius C, okay? Whereas this P without a subscript is the pressure exerted on the inside boundary, the actual applied pressure. If we use the expression for P sub C that we had, <clears throat> we can find the applied pressure as a function of C, which is the, again, the, the interface, the interfacial radius between the elastic and plastic parts. So what we would like is, for a given pressure, we'd like to know the value of C. You can, of course, you can, you can invert this in principle, maybe not by hand. Let's see if you can invert it in principle. Well, the applied pressure at the inside radius is now a function of C, the, the boundary between the elastic and plastic regions. To see if we can invert that, well, we just check the derivative of this P with respect to C. And when you do that, you find this, and that's strictly positive as long as C is less than B and, and vanishes when C equals B. So as long as, as long as any part of the bar, any part of this the material remains elastic, there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the applied pressure and this interfacial radius C, which means you can solve, in principle, you could graphically solve for C in terms of P if you want to because it's a monotone function. When C reaches B, the, the, which is as high as it can get, put C equal to B to get the ultimate pressure, right? That's the highest pressure that this spherical annulus can sustain. And that's given here. Okay, so there's a maximum pressure that the spherical annulus can sustain according to the theory. Beyond this pressure, well, let you, at, at this pressure, I should say, you can't get above this pressure, but at this pressure, the material could continue to expand, the sphere could co continue to expand at this constant pressure. Okay, so let's have a look at the displacement field now. Um, Before, before doing that, let's have a look at the deviatoric stress. Here, here's the radial component. According to our solution in the plastic region, that turns out to be this constant and the, the theta theta and phi phi components, we had this before, that that's, works out to be this according to our solution. So tau takes this value of this constant intensity here. 
let's reconstruct the Cauchy stress from this, knowing the deviatoric stress. The trace of T here is TRR plus theta theta plus phi phi, which is this, because the hoop stresses are equal. The theta theta stress is the RR stress plus root 3K. And TRR is known, so this trace is also a known function of radius and the parameter C. Okay. Uh, let's see. We'll suppose that tau remains at this fixed value for all time after the, after the initiation of yield in the plastic zone, plastic region. So if you look at the, the strain then, that is the, is the elastic part, the usual compliance times the stress, plus the time integral of the plastic part, epsilon dot plastic, if tau is remaining fixed, then we can take that outside the integral. Okay. And the trace then, because the trace of tau is zero, the trace will only come from the elastic response. And for isotropy, that if you recall, that's one over three times the bulk modulus times the trace of the stress. So the dilation of the material remains purely, purely elastic as you would expect. Let's see if we can use this to figure out what the displacement is. The trace of T we just had on the previous page, one third of that is equal to the bulk modulus times the trace of the strain. The trace of the strain is this. And this involves TRR, which is a known function. So now we have an opportunity to integrate this equation to get the displacement field in the plastic zone, right? Because we know TRR is a function of radius. We know the applied pressure in terms of the parameter C that remains unknown. But we can still integrate this equation because that parameter C acts like a constant when we integrate with respect to R, okay? So we're, we're going to have to do some difficult things here, like um, multiply by r squared times the natural log here, and then integrate that, and then divide by r squared again. That's tedious, but doable. What I'd like to do is match this displacement to the displacement from coming from the elastic region, match them at the interface. In the elastic region, the displacement has this structure. Some function, we'll call it a bar, function of time, b bar of time over r cubed, where a bar and b bar, remember we had them in terms of, we had them before, if you replace c by a, a rather small a by small c, then you have the, these functions of time, a bar and b bar, in the elastic region between c and b. And we know this, the pressure at C in terms of the parameter C, the radius C. Okay, so we have the displacement here in the elastic region. We wanna force it to, to match the displacement we get by integrating this in the plastic region. This is a first order differential equation. So we're gonna need one integration one condition, that condition will be continuity of the displacement with the elastic solution at R equals C. And if you go through that rather tedious exercise, you will find this function of R again in the plastic region. Again, in terms of the parameter C. So the, the, the structure of the, of the solution that's emerging tells us we should either regard C as being controlled, in which case the pressure can be backed out because we know P is a function of C, or, or we can regard the pressure as being assigned and then deduce what C is from the fact that P of C is a monotone function. So in principle, we can find C for a given P 
But now it's easier, as you see, it's easier to regard C as a parameter that's varying between small a and small b, and, and just then compute the pressure required to cause that variation, the movement of C. And here then is the displacement field as a function of radius in the plastic region between A and C. But again, expressed explicitly as a function of the parameter C. So quite clearly it's much easier to regard C as a controlled parameter and then you figure out the pressure required to produce that value of C just from this expression here. You prescribe C between small a and small b and figure out the pressure required to do it. And then you know the displacement in the plastic region. And also this is the displacement in the elastic region. So you're essentially finished. Um, we, have to, we have to check, so we, ha we have a complete solution now. We have to check that it's actually admissible from the point of view of dissipation. So recall the flow rule, um, the total strain dot minus the elastic strain dot, we call that E sub P dot, that's lambda times tau. Lambda is not the lambda modulus, but in this context is that non-negative scalar field. It has to be non-negative for the solution to be meaningful. Um, this pertains in the, in the plastic region, the, yield, the region that's yielded. Of course, you have an elastic strain even in the yielded region, of course, right? Um, if you look at the deviatoric part of this expression, the deviatoric part of the elastic strain rate is one over two mu times the deviatoric stress rate. But if the deviatoric stress is stuck at the value that we mentioned here, right, if it has this value in the, in the yielded zone, then its dot is zero. So the deviatoric part of the total strain rate is lambda times tau. Take an inner product of this equation with tau, you get tau inner product deviatoric epsilon dot is lambda squared norm of tau. So how would we proceed? Well, we know the displacement field in the plastic zone. This discussion here pertains to the, the, the zone that is yielded, this plastic zone or I should say the elastic plastic zone is, is distinct from the purely elastic zone between C and B. From this, you can figure out the strain and then the rate of strain will involve only C dot, right? So you could figure out the deviatoric part of the strain rate in terms of C dot, or if you prefer in terms of P dot, just by using the chain rule. You could figure all that out from this given U. Then you can come back here and confirm if the, if the left-hand side is indeed positive or not. So I'll ask you to do that in a homework. Okay. Confirm that indeed this scalar field here is positive for an increasing pressure or an increasing C. Okay. Okay, I think we're, I'll leave the, the, the last example for next time and end a little bit early here. Any questions? So these are, as I say, textbook examples, but I think it's useful to go over them just to indicate how uh, simple problems can be addressed in this framework. And of course, if you have a problem without symmetries, the kind that we've assumed, then you need to do some numerical work typically. Okay.